I just want to introduce John Gavlovsky. He's an extension entomologist for Manitoba Agriculture Food and Rural Initiatives. I've worked with John in my previous role uh, with council as agronomy specialist here in Manitoba. Worked with him a lot over the years, very knowledgeable about the various insect pests that we deal with in canola. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to uh, cover this topic today uh, last year, in spite of the wet conditions that we might have thought wouldn't be conducive to cutworm issues, uh, we did, through our Canola Watch Network, get a, a fair number of reports from right across the, the prairies from western Manitoba through into central Alberta of, of some fairly significant cutworm issues. And uh, part of that may be due to some different species showing up. So we felt it was important to uh, have John on to uh, talk a bit about that but he's also going to cover some other early season uh, insect uh, pests to watch for like flea beetles. So with that, I'll turn it over to John. Okay, thanks Derwin, and a welcome everybody. Uh, as Derwin mentioned, uh, I've got a few topics that I'll be uh, covering. Uh, one being cutworms and flea beetles. Here we go. So we'll, t we'll cover cutworms. Uh, we'll go over uh, first, a little bit of a description of different types of cutworms and the fact that uh, cutworms are not all alike. They behave and feed differently and it is good at times knowing what species you're dealing with when uh, we start making management decisions. We'll talk about scouting for cutworms, uh, a little bit about management, and with flea beetles we'll focus on the biology and management. And I'm also going to touch very briefly on wireworms. And uh, I guess their status in canola, what they uh, potentially can or can't do, and whether you should be concerned about them. And we'll touch very briefly on diamondback moth as well. So uh, that's the agenda for the morning. So to start with, what is a cutworm? Uh, cutworms, the, the term actually refers to a group of larvae belonging to a family of moths called Noctuidae. And this is a very big group of moths. There's uh, over 1,500 species in Canada. And actually our most common uh, type of cutworm in the prairies here, redback, uh, it belongs to a genus called Euxoa. And there's actually over 170 species of Euxoa in North America. So that alone is a very big group. Um, the point I want to make here is there are a lot of different species of cutworms. Uh, there are many species that are non-pest species. We've got a few that are pest species. Those would be the ones that I focus on. Uh, but also realize that cutworms, they're a natural part of our prairie habitat. Uh, any field you dig in, whether it's agricultural, whether it's a, a, a pasture, roadside, um, uh, some forest or bush near your farm, if you look hard enough, you're going to find cutworms. And the big question isn't so much, are they there, it's are they a potential economic threat to the crop? Because as mentioned, if you look hard enough, you will find cutworms. So one of the uh, things that is good to know is what species are present. And this will actually vary from region to region quite a bit. Uh, in the U.S. Corn Belt in Ontario, the major damaging species often is something called black cutworm, a species that we do get in the Canadian prairies, but usually in very low levels. It's uh, uh, not normally a pest species here, but again, throughout much of the Corn Belt and Ontario, it is. And when you start hearing about uh, major cutworm problems in central U.S. or northern U.S., often it is black cutworm that they're referring to. Uh, here in the prairies, uh, the eastern prairies, usually redback cutworm, possibly dingy, maybe dark-sided. Those would be our main pest species. Uh, further west in the prairies, pale western cutworm, army cutworm, they can be um, greater economic issues. The other point I'd like to make regarding cutworms is that you often do find more than one species in a field. Uh, in an outbreak or a situation where there are very high levels, often there is a dominant species, but there may be times when you've got two, three, or more species that uh, seem to be uh, equal or dominant in a field. 
Some people have tried to uh, group cutworms based on their feeding behavior. And I've picked uh, a grouping based on a publication by Story. That's what came out in the 80s. Now, in fact sheets and literature, you will see different groupings based on feeding behavior. This is the one that I picked to go with, uh, again, because it is uh, something that was published in a reputable uh, scientific journal. Uh, the group referred to as surface feeding cutworms. These would be things like your red back cutworms, your dark sided cutworms. These are cutworms that will come above the ground. Uh, they will feed on the plants. Older stages of them may clip the plants. Some species do, some species not so much. Uh, red back cutworm, dark sided cutworm, when they're young, they will uh, defoliate plants, so they will take notches out of leaves, but not necessarily cut them. When they get older, that's when they often start doing their cutting for those species. Something like dingy cutworm also falls into this category. And uh, dingy cutworm uh, very rarely will do a lot of cutting. Uh, sometimes they will, but there are a lot of times when they are mainly just defoliating and not really cutting plants. So behaviorally, there are differences between species. Another category is your tunnel makers. And this would be things like uh, uh, your pale western, your, your black cutworm. Um, and some people will actually subdivide this into two groups and put things like pale western in this subterranean category and things like tunnel makers in uh, put something like black cutworm in that category. But I've combined them for the purposes of this presentation. And then a, a third group is climbing cutworms, a uh, large group. This is things like our armyworms, the clover cutworm, even Bertha armyworm falls into this category. These are species that, for the most part, are feeding later in the season, so not necessarily on seedlings. And they will climb the plant, uh, feed during the day, and go back down to the soil at night and hide in the soil uh, during the day to come out at night and feed. So for the species that we deal with in the Canadian prairies, uh, our surface feeders, again, uh, redback and dingy, uh, two of our common species. So redback cutworm, a surface feeder, uh, will do clipping. Dark-sided cutworm, same thing. Uh, some people have categorized this as a climber. It will under certain circumstances, but for the most part, it is a surface feeder. Uh, but uh, one difference between these, again, is uh, the top two here, redback and dark sided, will do a fair amount of clipping when they get bigger. Dingy often doesn't. And then we get species like glassy cutworm, pale western, which will come above the ground, but more so to move to new feeding uh, locations, but tend to like to feed below ground, so they will do a lot of feeding. Uh, on lower parts of the plant, they will clip stems and uh, drag plants even into their, their tunnels to feed, but they do not come above ground and defoliate plants as much as the other species, especially when they're older larvae. Young larvae sometimes do, especially with pale western, but older larvae, um, oh, sorry, uh, older larvae tend to stay in the ground and prefer to feed more subterranean. So what I'm going to do is go over. Uh, four or five of our most common species, and I'll try to give a few pointers on how you would identify them and what to look for with their feeding and their, their patterns of feeding. I'm going to start with redback cutworm because uh, this is actually, in, at least in the eastern part of the prairies, uh, in most cases this is one of our dominant species when we have heavy cutworm populations. And one thing you will note on redback cutworm is they have these two reddish stripes that go down the back. I say reddish because it does vary. You can see in this one here, it's more of a, uh, uh, a darker color than, say, this individual here. It still does have the two red stripes, a little bit lighter shade, so that, that does vary a bit. Uh, it may depend on the stage that they're in, uh, how recently they've molted. Uh, factors like that will determine the more specific coloring, but you will notice it'll be easy to see in the older larvae the two red stripes going down the back. So that's how they get their name, redback cutworm. Uh, 
Uh, again, they are a species that will uh, clip plants when they get bigger. When they're younger, they will do a lot of um, notching and feeding on the plants, but not so much clipping when they're young. So when you're initially scouting fields, you may see notching and uh, defoliation, but not necessarily clipped plants on the field. If you're seeing that and you're not seeing insects in the field, at least consider that it could be cutworms and do some digging around the plants and try to verify that that is the cause. The other thing with redback cutworm, and actually quite a few species, is that they can be very localized in a field. Uh, often the moths are attracted to uh, flat, late, late flowering plants in a field in August and September when they're laying eggs. And often you do get very patchy distributions with this species. And that's good to know when you're trying to decide should you control them and specifically how you're going to. Because if it's a very patchy distribution, patch spraying may be all you need. So dark-sided cutworm is another fairly common species across the prairies. And they call them dark-sided. Uh, they've got these brown stripes on their side, and that's how they're getting the name dark-sided. But again, it's not a very, it's not black, it's not um, uh, extremely dark. It's a darker shade of brown is what it is. On the top, they have this lighter, almost a gray or very light brown striping. So they also have two stripes on the back. But in red back cutworm, the stripes were red. In this case, again, they're more gray or uh, a light brownish color. And again, they've got the uh, darker brown striping on the side. So if you're seeing those, that's dark-sided cutworm. Uh, they're very similar to red back cutworm in their feeding behavior, their patchiness. And in many ways, you'll note it's the same genus. Uh, Uxoa, uh, redback cutworm also belong, belongs to that genus. And they, these are very similar species. Often you will find them together in a field as well. Now another species that is somewhat different in both uh, appearance and feeding behavior is dingy cutworm. And one thing that you'll note on the back of dingy cutworm is the line isn't really a nice even straight line like we saw with redback and dark sided. It looks more like a series of V's that go up the back of the body. Uh, some people refer to these as a tire track pattern. That's a good way to help you remember it. But if you see the tire track pattern or the series of V's, uh, that is likely dingy cutworm. And so here's your V pattern again. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, dingy cutworm is a species that does not clip plants as much as some species. So what you would see with dingy is a lot of foliation. Uh, I've seen fields where they've literally cleaned off a whole patch of field, but they don't leave a lot of cut plants. They were literally eating them to the ground, and the patch was expanding. That's the way they would be feeding. So less clipping. Uh, the other thing with dingy cutworm that is worth noting is they overwinter as a larva. And what that means is that early in the season, they will be larger than something like a red-backed or a dark-sided cutworm, which overwinters eggs. Uh, now, they will go through their cycle and be pupating sooner than a red-backed or dark-sided cutworm. And again, this is one reason it's good to know what species you're dealing with, because it helps us in predicting how long the population will remain and how much feeding they may be doing very early on in the season. Glassy cutworm, I won't spend much time on this because for canola growers, this really is not likely to be a pest species. They prefer grassy crops. Easy one to identify. Uh, actually, saying that, there are a few similar species. But generally, with glassy cutworm, uh, they have a very almost translucent appearance. Uh, an almost orangey uh, head capsule and a brownish plate in back. But again, if you start finding a lot of these in a canola field, uh, you really don't need to worry too much. If there's any grassy weeds in the field, they're probably more interested in the grassy weeds in your canola crop. Uh, they're more of a grass feeder, and odds are they're going to leave your canola alone. 
Uh, pale western cutworm, uh, it, it has a very broad host range and uh, would be a threat to canola. Uh, again, it's somewhat translucent, but it doesn't have the, uh, the orangey head that the glassy did or the brownish plate and behind it's much darker head capsule and plate. So these two should be easy to tell apart. Uh, this is more of a threat in the western part of the prairies. We really don't see a lot of pale western cutworm in Manitoba, but western Saskatchewan and Alberta, it can be uh, certainly an economic species. It does like drier conditions. Uh, they like drier soils, so in Manitoba, especially this year, it would not be good for pale western cutworm. Army cutworm, again, this is more of a western prairies concern. Uh, they have this habit that when the moths emerge over the summer, they tend to migrate to the Rocky Mountain area, and then populations will migrate back over the prairies later in the season. Uh, a lot of years, the migrations back across the prairies don't make it as far as Manitoba, or barely do. So again, it's uh, more of an Alberta and maybe western Saskatchewan concern. In some years, they may move into Manitoba and become an issue. Uh, again, this is another Euothoa species, so similar to redback cutworm and dark-sided cutworm in many ways with their feeding behavior and biology. So scouting for cutworms. I've already mentioned uh, even the species that do a lot of clipping, initially they start out by notching plants and just general defoliation. So if you start seeing plants that are, have feeding damage, whether it's your crop or weeds. Early on, sometimes a lot of the defoliation is to weeds. Now, that's not a bad thing from the perspective of eating your weeds, but it does tip you off that there could be a cutworm population in this field that is worth checking out. So again, if you're seeing early season notching and you're not seeing a lot of insects during the day, do some digging, look around, and try to find the cutworms. When the cutworms are big, like in my picture here, uh, they are easy to find by just digging. When cutworms are small, it is much more difficult. And often what I do is I have a, uh, a tray or a large uh, basin with me that I take out to the field. And I'll put up the, the soil in the basin and shake it around a bit and try to level it out and look for the cutworms. Uh, because just by poking around with a jackknife or or a paint scraper or something, and looking for the cutworms in the soil. When they're big, it's easy to find it. When they're small, it is much tougher. And sometimes it's nice to take a bit of soil and uh, go through it a bit more closely and, and look for them. The other thing to note, I've mentioned here, they are nocturnal. Nocturnal meaning they like to feed at night, and they like to hide during the day. So again, when you're doing daytime field scouting, they're in the soil or they're under stubble. Uh, if there's a lot of stubble in the field, often they don't really go into the soil so much. They just go beneath the stubble. So when you're doing the daytime scouting, you do have to do a bit of digging or look under the stubble for them. When you start finding cutworms in a field, there's a few things that would be good to take note of. Certainly the species, if you can identify it, uh, that is very helpful, especially if you're you're trying to follow up with others as to what is a, an appropriate threshold or um, management strategy. Knowing the species is very helpful. The level of cutworms, of course, and the amount of plant damage you're seeing is important. So having some sort of estimate of numbers per foot square or meter square or the amount of defoliation you're seeing, that is very helpful to have. Uh, as a crop scout, you likely don't have the time to be sifting through a whole meter square of soil looking for cutworms, but if you can mark out a foot square uh, and go through that, uh, you can do a little bit of math and provide foot square or meter square counts that uh, can help with decision making. The size and stage of the cutworms is also important. So that is something you, you definitely want to take note of. Uh, the species I have in my picture here is a redback cutworm. In the middle, I've got my larva. And to either side, there's a pupa. Uh, 
when you start digging up uh, larger larvae and pupae, you do have cutworms, but they are at a size where even if there's a lot of them, it's probably no longer economical to be controlling them. Uh, the pupa stage is a non-feeding stage, and after that you will get a moth later in the season. But the damaging stage, the larva, is done once they've started to pupate. They're done for the season. Our damaging species have one generation per year. So once you start seeing these pupa, and even larger larva, once the majority of cutworms are large larva, uh, an inch or more in length, you're pretty much through the most uh, critical stage as far as uh, scouting and management because they've done their damage basically and uh, at this point their cycle is coming to the non-damaging stages. And as mentioned earlier, look for patches in the field. Uh, things can be very patchy and for management purposes there's no use spraying a whole field if say 30 acres out of 100 is affected. Uh, sometimes you can just do the, the patches and that's all you need to do. Uh, how deep do you need to look? Uh, really, there's not a lot of good research on this. For dark-sided cutworm, there is. Uh, there's a study from Ontario where what they found was for older larvae, if it was wet, if the soil was wet, they would be just underneath the soil surface. But once the soil dried out, they could be found as deep as about 8 to 10 centimeters which is three to four inches below the soil surface. So it depends, it's likely going to depend on the species, the stage of the cutworm, and how wet the soil is. Younger larvae uh, do like to rest just below the soil surface. So again, uh, stage will likely de uh, determine how deep they are going and how deep you need to be looking. Now when we talk about thresholds for cutworms, uh, this is kind of a tricky subject because the reality is we do have a lot of thresholds that have been posted for various crops, but most of these are what we call nominal thresholds, meaning we don't have good quantifiable data to back up the threshold we're using. We have a lot of observations and uh, people in most cases have made literally educated guesses as to what a good threshold should be uh, based on the fact that there isn't good quantifiable data for the threshold. The threshold that tends to get used in canola is 25 to 30 percent stand reduction. That's been suggested. But again, realize that is a nominal threshold. It's uh, basically been put in place so that there is some guidance as to uh, when you would spray for cutworms, but you cannot find a peer-reviewed scientific study to back up that threshold. It doesn't exist. Nobody's done the work. It would be tough work to do. It could be done, but it'd be very tough research, and for the time being, a nominal threshold really is all we can use, and, and that's the case for many crops. Also, when we're talking um, cutworm damage and thresholds, one thing to consider is a canola plant removed, if you have, say, 5% canola plants removed, it does not mean you're going to have a 5% yield reduction. Or if 10% are, are removed, it does not mean there will be a 10% yield reduction. Canola does have some ability to compensate for damaged plants early in the season. Obviously, if the plants are cut, they're dead. But surrounding plants will often produce more pods and more seeds when the canopy becomes a bit thinner. So again, that 10% remove does not necessarily translate into 10% yield loss. There will be some yield loss. It may not be 10%. And how much the canola compensates will partially depend on how good the growing conditions are. So some plants can compensate to some degree for cutworm feeding, other plants less so. The other thing to consider when we're talking about thresholds is again cutworms are a very diverse group and they have different feeding behaviors. And the, the study that I'm referring to in this slide here, the authors were comparing, they're actually trying to develop a, a, an economic threshold for black cutworm and, and um, playback cutworm in the U.S. But they were comparing the feeding to dingy cutworm, one of our non-clippers. 
And one of their statements from their publication was that the damage threshold was higher for the surface feeding cutworms, in this case being the uh, dark, um, uh, sorry, the, the dingy cutworm, than for the cutting species, being your black cutworm and your clayback. So what they were finding is the, uh, the, the thresholds are going to differ depending on the feeding habits, whether it's a clipper or a species that feeds more on the foliage, like a dingy cutworm. So in reality, if we ever did uh, get a lot of uh, threshold work uh, accomplished on cutworms, the thresholds are likely to vary depending on the species. So management of cutworms, I'm going to talk a little bit about natural enemies, uh, how we would best use insecticides to manage cutworms, and the effect that cultural practices such as tillage may have on cutworms. As far as natural enemies go, um, there are predators, parasites, uh, even viruses and funguses that can help take down a cutworm population. Uh, predators are probably, um, they're, they're something we can't underestimate. They probably don't have as big of an impact as parasites and some of the diseases, but they're something that is very consistent in the environment and uh, can be keeping levels uh, below thresholds in some years. A study done in Alberta back in the early 70s, they were looking at ground beetles, which are, um, those are the black or potentially brown beetles that you often see when you're disturbing the stubble or turning over a clump of soil. They will scurry uh, across the soil as you disturb them because they also like to feed at night and hide in the day. But they found seven species of ground beetles feeding on larvae and pupa of redback cutworms in fields in Alberta. And they actually found 21 species of ground beetles that in the lab would feed on eggs of the redback cutworm. So a lot of different types of ground beetles out there. And again, they do like feeding on um, cutworms, uh, among other things. And uh, ground beetles are just one example of a predator. There's bee fly, larva, uh, a lot of different things that will feed on cutworms. Parasites as well uh, can at times be very effective in taking down a cutworm population. Study in Ontario looking at parasites of uh, dark-sided cutworm, they found that there were 10 species of hymenopteris, so these are parasitic wasps, and four species of flies that were reared from dark-sided cutworm. So 14 different species of parasites in that one study. The most abundant of these I've given the scientific name here because most of these don't have common names, but this uh, Capitosoma bakeri was the most common of the parasites. And interestingly enough, a study by Byers et al. in Alberta in um, the early 90s found that this was also the most abundant parasite of the army cutworm, often exceeding 50%. And what I mean by that is 50% uh, or more of the larvae had this parasite in them when they dug them up during this uh, uh, higher population of army cutworms in the early 90s. So they can be quite effective. Uh, one side note about this parasite, though, is they often don't kill the larva right away. The larva will continue feeding for quite a while, which helps the parasite um, larvae develop within the caterpillar. And at times, they've had hundreds, and I've seen uh, some publications suggesting thousands of these parasites emerge from one army cutworm larva. So they can reproduce quickly and uh, build their populations up, which in the previous year would uh, work towards really bringing that cutworm population down. There's been a few studies looking at the effect of tillage on cutworms. Uh, the one that I'm going to focus on actually is one done in Manitoba by Turnock et al. in the early 90s. And what they found was that uh, in comparing conventional tilled fields with minimally tilled fields, they did find more cutworms overall in the minimally tilled field. But what they did find was a much bigger diversity of species in the minimal tilled fields, and a lot of the cutworms and species they were finding were, were what they categorized as non-pest species. So one of the conclusions from their publication was that 
this increased diversity suggested a more stable ecosystem where outbreaks of cutworms would be less because, uh, again, you had a greater diversity of parasites as well as a greater diversity of the cutworm species. So uh, where you do get outbreaks is often in situations where uh, parasite numbers, predators, parasites, the things that uh, will feed on and naturally control cutworms are lacking or in uh, smaller abundance. Uh, one of the cutworm species that they found more of in the minimally tilled fields was bristly cutworm. And again, there were several other species that they just categorized as non-pest species that just seemed to be a lot more abundant in these minimally tilled fields. So uh, I think more research needs to be done, really, on the effect that reduced tillage does have on cutworms. But it's likely to vary with the species of cutworm, whether or not they find minimally tilled fields more attractive or not. And certainly for some of the non-pest species, uh, the minimally tilled fields do seem a bit more attractive. But again, that's not to suggest that you will have more cutworm problems in minimally tilled fields, because Turnock's study suggested the opposite may happen. Another thing to consider regarding cutworms and their biology when you start trying to figure out a management strategy and evaluate how effective it might be is that cutworms, when they grow, they do something called molting. So for a cutworm to grow to a bigger size, what they need to do is shed their cuticle, their, which is basically their, their, uh, their outer skeleton. They have to shed that so they can grow. And right before they shed their skeleton, they stop feeding for a period of time. When they've shed their skeleton and they're actually into their molt, they're not feeding. And then there's a short period of time after the molt where they're still not feeding until that the new skeleton uh, reforms and, and grows. And then they go into another feeding phase. So throughout the life of the cutworms, they're going through these feeding and non-feeding cycles. Now, uh, an interesting study done in Alberta in the early 90s by Byers et al., they found in four fields that they sampled, Anywhere from about 20 to 50 percent of the pale western cutworms they were finding were in a pre-molt or recently post-molt condition and were not feeding. So 20 to 50 percent of cutworms not feeding. For insecticides to kill cutworms, uh, if you spray in the evening, there can be some contact kill, but uh, molting cutworms often aren't moving around a lot either. Uh, you're really relying on the cutworms doing some feeding the evening or in the following evenings after you've sprayed. So if you've got 20 to 50 percent of cutworms not feeding, what may happen is you may go into that field a day or two later, start digging around and find that you're still finding a lot of live cutworms. Now that does not mean your insecticide failed or that it was a bad choice. What it might mean is that you've just got a lot of molting cutworms in that field. Now, the good news is uh, the insecticides we use to control cutworms generally do have long enough residuals that um, even when those molting cutworms do resume feeding, they should be killed by the insecticides. And just to show one of the studies that demonstrates this, uh, there's actually been quite a few studies on cutworms and um, the residual periods for insecticides. I've picked one that focused heavily on the pyrethroid and organophosphate groups that we commonly use. And what they found in this study uh, done in Ontario on mainly dark-sided cutworms was that six days after spraying, the pyrethroids they used, daltomethrin, which is your desis, cypermethrin, and permethrin, uh, they continued to cause uh, death to the cutworms close to 70% six days later. So the pyrethroid group in general has very good uh, residual against cutworms. In this particular study, they found the organophosphate group had less residual and gave less kill uh, six days after the feeding. So that it was, in many cases, it was below 50 percent. Uh, and, and this, in this particular study, uh, chlorpyrifos, which is your lower span, uh, pyrinex, nufos, that group, and acephate were the organophosphates that uh, they were using.
Uh, timing of cutworm control. Again, they are nocturnal. So they feed at night. They hide in the day. So obviously, to get best kill, spray as close as possible to evening, or even in the evening if that's possible. And as mentioned, uh, they can be patchy. So at times, you may be just wanting to do a patch instead of a whole field. So I'm going to move into wireworms and uh, talk very briefly about wireworms, and then we'll move into flea beetles. So uh, first of all, uh, wireworms are very different than cutworms in many ways. Uh, Appearance-wise, uh, the photo I'm showing here, these are two wireworms. And one thing you'll note is wireworms have three very small pairs of legs up near the front. They do not have any legs in the back of their body, on the back of the abdomen. Cutworms will have small fleshy legs at the back. They're called prolegs. Wireworms don't have them. So only three pair of legs at the front and at the back. Uh, Color-wise, wireworms are more uh, a pale yellow, sometimes they're even a darker yellow color. There are many species, and they do vary a little bit in their color, size, and shape. But they all generally uh, have a very similar appearance. Wireworms never come above the ground to feed as larvae. They're always below ground, so you will not kill them with a foliar insecticide. Um, and in canola, they will feed on canola. It's probably not one of their preferred hosts, but again, there's been very little research done on that, so we just don't know a lot about their feeding potential in canola. One thing that's interesting, though, is there have been a few studies looking at uh, ground up canola meal as a potential uh, management tool for wireworms. Uh, they found that uh, brassica napis, which is your canola tissue, showed potential at reducing the populations of some species of wireworm. And there have been studies, again, looking at uh, whether or not some of the glucosinolates in canola seed and canola meal can be used as a possible uh, wireworm management uh, tool. But one caution I have is there are many species of wireworms. There's potentially about 30 pest species of wireworms in uh, Canada. Whether or not this applies to all species or the species that I've noted in uh, my slide here, I don't know. So uh, again, we need to know more about the feeding behavior and biology of wireworms in canola. So I'm going to move on to flea beetles now and uh, finish up by talking a bit about flea beetles. Uh, John? Yes? John, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I was going to leave it till the end, but we've got a couple of questions that are quite specific to cutworms, and I think might apply a bit to the wireworms as well. Sure. So I thought maybe we could just deal with those now before we move on. Um, one is related to uh, rotation, and the specific question was, I've heard that planted canola uh, behind old alfalfa fields can increase the possible infestation of cutworms. Uh, what crop rotation should be avoided if possible? And so I guess just around that, what are the high risk uh, rotations if you're looking at canola and where to put it in the rotation? And if you want to expand that to comments with regard to wireworms as well, I think that would be great. Okay. Uh, I'll address the cutworm part first. Uh, one thing we have to realize regarding cutworms is they have one cycle a year, and the adult moths come out in August and September primarily, and that's when they're flying around uh, laying their eggs, which is going to result in the next year's problem or population. So what is going to attract them into a field or an area is for a lot of species, they like to have a nectar source when they're laying their eggs. So especially if it's a flowering field of alfalfa, uh, that potentially could attract the moth to that area for egg laying. So a field right next door to it, again, this is a bit of speculation, but could have uh, some higher levels of cutworms. Uh, but really, even weed patches can do the same thing. Um, just to give you an example, I was in a, a sunflower field north of Carmen here one year, 
and very, very heavy patch of cutworm was in the field, but it was maybe 20, 30 acres out of a couple hundred. And um, that particular area had been a very heavy thistle patch the previous season. It matched up very closely. And uh, things like that, heavy uh, weed patches that potentially could be flowering late in the season would attract cutworms to an area. So as far as rotation goes, um, realize that anything that is uh, flowering in August and September may attract cutworms to an area, but not just the crop, but even weed patches can have an effect at uh, drawing cutworms into an area. And again, that will vary with the species of cutworms that are dominant in an area. So hopefully that answers that. Regarding wireworms, uh, wireworms have more than one year life cycles. They will live several years as a larva in the soil. Again, Finding a thin species. So uh, rotation can have some effect. What you want to avoid with wireworms is putting, um, if you're putting a crop in after either pasture or a perennial crop stand like alfalfa, you have a higher risk, particularly if you're breaking pasture. You have a, quite a high risk. Canola after pasture, you might want to put something other than canola in for a year where you can put a seed treatment on that would uh, deter the wireworms from feeding. Uh, realize the deterrents that we have right now for wireworms don't necessarily kill them. They more or less make them sick for a period of time. They don't feed. So even two years after breaking pasture, you could have a wireworm problem in a field, even if you use the seed treatment for wireworms the previous season. Good comments, John. Sorry about that. I was jumping in with the next question on cutworms there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully everybody got that. Um, the next question on cutworms was around if you've got thin patches starting to show up and it's related to cutworm feeding, um, is it effective enough to do the patch spraying um, versus spraying the whole f uh, field? And, and how far outside of the bare area do you need to go to get f effective control if, if you're taking that approach? Yeah, regarding the patchiness of cutworms, uh, again, you, you certainly want to scalp the field thoroughly. Uh, don't just assume that uh, the cutworm problem ends where the patch ends. Really, how far you should spray uh, will depend to some degree on levels of cutworms you're finding outside of that patch. Uh, do a bit of scouting and digging around. And uh, if the cutworm population seems to be uh, ending in the, the, the damaged patch of crop. Uh, a spray or wet there too may be all you need to be doing, uh, but there is no magical number really, and it de again depends how concentrated they would be within that patch and how many cutworms are being found outside uh, the, the patch of heavier feeding. Uh, so re really uh, crop scouting uh, is going to uh, provide the data that's going to answer that question. Great. There's no magical number I can give you on that one. Okay. Thanks, John. I, I think the rest of the questions you dealt with subsequently in your slides. So uh, I think that's all on the cutworms and wireworms. So I'll let you move on. Okay, that's great. So we'll move on to flea beetles. And uh, as I did with cutworms, I'm going to start by talking very broadly about the diversity of flea beetles. Because when we talk flea beetles, we're not talking about a species. We're talking about a group of species. A study done in Manitoba uh, in the 90s, they found there were 72 species of flea beetles. Actually, um, the study done in Manitoba focused on crucifer crops. And within crucifer crops like canola, there were 10 species alone that fed on the crucifer crops. And 72 species uh, known to feed on uh, plants in Manitoba. Now, some of these 72 species are actually beneficial species, and some have actually been released purposely because they feed on nothing but weeds. An example of that, there's two aphthona species of flea beetles that were purposely introduced because they feed on nothing but leafy spurge. And they basically would look similar to our, our crucifer flea beetles that feed on canola, but they're brown. 
Uh, one is somewhat black. Some people might have trouble telling it from a crucifer flea beetle, but it would only be on leafy spurge. So a big group. Um, not all flea beetles are bad. Some are, some aren't. Um, one thing that is characteristic of all flea beetles is they do have this very enlarged hind back leg. And when you disturb them, you will notice they jump like a flea would, which is partially why they get their name flea beetles. So I mentioned there's 10 species that will feed on canola and other crucifer crops in Manitoba. In my slide here, I'm showing two of them and our most damaging two. At the bottom here is your crucifer flea beetle. This one is your most damaging species in the Canadian prairies. Uh, the top of my uh, cotyledon here, these two are stretch flea beetles. They come out a bit earlier than crucifer flea beetle. Usually they're not as abundant, but again, it depends on the year. Uh, oftentimes their cycle is uh, becoming, coming to its end and they're decreasing by the time the canola is up even. Whereas with the crucifer flea beetle, they tend to peak in population in late May and their timing seems to be lined up very well with when the canola seems to be coming out. Um, a study looking at where flea beetles emerge from and when they start moving was done in Alberta uh, a few years back. And what they did with this study was they were putting emergence traps in stubble and in the bush and looking at uh, where they're emerging from. So here's an emergence trap. This, this is actually one that we have out this year uh, near Carmen. And we're uh, also doing a similar study, but looking more at uh, weather conditions that affect emergence. But anyway, this study by Almer and Dahl, so they found that they had significantly more flea beetles coming out of sheltered locations than open habitat. And we've known that from previous studies. Uh, shelter belt, uh, any heavy bush uh, will be a, a good overwintering site for them. They do not overwinter well in a field. And even if there is a little bit of stubble from the previous year in the field, uh, they just don't seem to overwinter well in those habitats. They prefer the bush or areas where there's some trees and shrubs. Um, also, peak emergence tends to occur near the end of May as the mean ground temperatures reach about 15 degrees Celsius. So that's when they would be starting to come out. And we have seen flea beetles in our emergence traps in the bush this year in the Carmen area. So uh, they are flying. Right now, we're finding mainly stretched flea beetles on our traps, though. So as far as early season movement is concerned, there's two things that really affect when they're going to be flying and, uh, and how far they're going to be going. One is temperature, the other is wind speed. And a study by Bob Lamb back in the 80s uh, in Manitoba looked at uh, their early season movement in biology. And what Bob found in his study was that the overwintering flea beetles would fly when the daily uh, maximum temperatures exceeded 14 degrees. But on days when the temperature was less than 14 degrees, they wouldn't be flying. So a day like today would not be a day when you would find a lot of flea beetles out flying. It's too cold and too windy. Uh, in Bob's study, he also found that suction traps uh, were finding a negative correlation with average wind speed, meaning the windier it was, the less flea beetles that were flying. So uh, I realize they are a small insect. Uh, they can fly a significant distance, but uh, with strong winds, they tend to stay put. They do not fly on days when it's very windy. So a, uh, a good day for flying from a, from a flea beetle's perspective is a warm day and a calm day. That's when they're going to be moving out in big numbers into your field and doing their feeding. Cooler days and windier days, they're going to stay put. Even if it's hot out but it's windy, they're probably not going to be moving around as much. So stages when feeding is significant. There's been a few studies on this. And the one that I'm going to refer to here was, again, a study done in Manitoba back in the 80s. And what they found was that yield was reduced the most when plants were damaged during the seedling to second true leaf stage, but was not reduced when, there, when the plants were damaged during the third to fourth true leaf stage. And there's been a few studies that have sort of backed up this conclusion that generally speaking, seedling to two leaf stage is when the plants are vulnerable. Once you get three or four true leaves, 
usually the plants can compensate well enough from the feeding that uh, the economic damage should not be occurring. So it's that seedling to two leaf stage that is most vulnerable. Again, this is a general conclusion. Uh, you do have to use some uh, good scouting sense, and if the population is extremely heavy, uh, you might find that there's enough damage to, say, plants with three or four true leaves that things could still be economical. But in general, once you get three or four true leaves, the plants are going to outgrow it. So uh, another study by Bob Lamb in the early 80s, he also looked at how flea beetles affect canola. And uh, there were four different things that he was testing and he looked at in the study. And what he found was that uh, the flea beetles were causing uh, a delay in the plant development and also an, an, a very uneven uh, canopy as far as height and maturity went. So your, your, uh, your maturity is very uneven, making um, for problems later in the season. Uh, certainly when there was heavy feeding, there was reduced seed yield, and also the chlorophyll content of the seeds can be increased. So those are a few ways that flea beetles can affect the plant throughout the season. So the challenge for a canola grower or an agronomist is getting the plants to that uh, three to four leaf stage without getting significant flea beetle feeding. And I've shown two different seedlings here. These were both taken at our research farm near Carmen. And in fact, I believe they were uh, from the same field. And the one seedling, you can see this one is beaten up pretty good. It's a lot of feeding. This seedling here is, uh, it does have flea beetle feeding. And I, I should note, all these little white pits, that's flea beetle feeding. The flea beetles, when they feed, usually don't go right through the uh, cotyledon. They just make pits. Those pits will dry out, and sometimes uh, they will break open, and you do get holes, shot holes, as we call them, in the cotyledons. But in a field, you'll often have a range of different feeding. Uh, and again, I, I picked the most extreme plant and one with more minimal damage to make this um, point. But you will get a range of feeding in a field. If most of your field looks like this here, where there's just the odd pit in a plant, that's not a problem. And even in fields where you've used Prosper or Helix or Gaucho, you will get this because the flea beetles have to take a, a bite or two to die. So don't get panicky if you start seeing the odd pit in a cotyledon. Uh, it doesn't mean that your seed treatment is no longer working. And it doesn't mean that you have an economical situation. Uh, the plants will outgrow that damage very well. When you start getting situations like this, odds are either your seed treatment is no longer effective uh, or the flea beetles just aren't being killed. Uh, this is more severe damage and certainly that would cause the uh, damage symptoms that uh, Bob's study earlier referred to. Uh, a tool that could help you with this decision making is a, uh, a foliage uh, damage scale and actually, Julie Soroka with Agriculture Canada in Saskatoon has been working on this and is actually in the process of putting out a fact sheet with such a scale. And uh, what the scale does is it shows different levels of defoliation. Um, so here we have 10%. Again, a little bit of pitting, nothing too economical. Where we consider the economic threshold to be is about 25%. So, 20% you're getting towards where things could be economical, 30%. This area onwards, if they look like this, you have an economical situation where you may need to do a foliar spray or some further control. And again, Julie has been working on getting that fact sheet out, so I hope that that will be available soon and it will be a good tool to use to help uh, estimate is the feeding you're seeing economical. Uh, just a few comments about cultural practices like seeding dates and tillage and flea beetles. Um, this year we're going to be doing a lot of late seeding in the prairies, maybe uh, Alberta and western Saskatchewan less so, but Manitoba, uh, very little canola has been seeded so far. And I imagine eastern Saskatchewan is the same. So it'll be a year with a lot of late seeding. Uh, there's a few studies that have looked at what impact seeding date can have on flea beetle damage. 
A study from Alberta, they found that early seeding reduced flea beetle feeding in southern Alberta, but the early seeding actually increased damage in central and northern Alberta. A study in North Dakota, they found that the early seeding actually increased the injury by flea beetle. And also in Manitoba, a study back in the 80s found that early seeding dates, uh, the canola suffered more damage by flea beetles. So uh, to try to put a silver lining to some of the later seeding, for many regions, it could result in less flea beetle feeding. Uh, what would be happening in this case is the flea beetles would already be on the downward side of their cycles, meaning they're starting to die off by the time the canola is in the more vulnerable stages. And especially if you have a seed treatment like Helix Prosper or Gaucho on there, by the time those treatments wear out, hopefully it's in the late seeding cases, the flea beetle population should be starting to decline. Uh, this is a bit of speculation about winter canola on the prairies. There has been studies that have looked at what effect, if we ever got to this point, what effect this would have on flea beetles. A uh, study by Dawes, Dolan Stevenson, a few years back, they found that flea beetle damage was much less on canola seeded in the fall than spring seeded canola. In this case, the canola was actually getting to that three to four leaf stage before the uh, heavier flea beetle populations were out. Tillage and flea beetles. Uh, flea beetles actually like a, a very exposed, ideally uh, sunny, relatively warm environment to feed in. So what reduced tillage does is it provides a more sheltered, damper, cooler environment. And uh, there have been some studies that have shown less flea beetle feeding uh, in minimal or zero-till fields. Uh, again, several states have sort of backed up this conclusion. Again, the flea beetles just don't find it as attractive uh, of an environment. And seeding rate can also affect uh, how much damage you get on the cotyledons. And in this case, what's happening is the, the damage is probably being dispersed among more plants, so you're not as likely to be reaching those economic uh, thresholds I mentioned earlier. Uh, another side note that I'm mentioning in the bottom part of this slide is with those higher seeding rates, you also get um, less root maggot damage to canola. And that's more because of the, the egg laying behavior of the maggots is interfered with, uh, with the higher density fields. As far as varieties go, uh, most people are growing Brassica napis varieties nowadays, so it's probably um, not as important of, of a point. But some studies have found that Brassica rapa, your Polish canola, uh, can be damaged more by flea beetles than the, na the napis varieties. But that being said, there have been a couple studies that have found no difference. And there has been at least one study that showed napis varieties more susceptible than rapa. So Bottom line, it probably depends on the variety of napis or rapa that you'd be growing. Um, in general, though, the, the napis varieties are a bit more resistant than the rapa varieties. But as we know, uh, flea beetles certainly can do very significant damage. And as a side note, the napis varieties also are a, a bit more resistant to root maggots than the uh, the wrapper varieties. Uh, if anyone is also growing mustard, uh, another crucifer crop, uh, note that yellow mustard seems to have quite a high level of resistance to flea beetle damage in comparison to canola. Uh, when you give them the choice in cages, when you cage flea beetles on plants and, and they have a choice between mustard and canola, they will often uh, very heavily damage the canola before they really even touch the mustard. So there's something in mustard, some glucosinolates, that they just do not like as much. As far as insecticides go, I've mentioned already the seed treatments. Uh, a lot of the canola already, when you buy it, will have uh, Helix or Prospa or potentially Gaucho uh, on the seed. And again, hopefully that will give you enough protection to get you through that vulnerable period. But do realize if canola is seeded early, and it sits in the seedling stage for 
several weeks, uh, three or four weeks before it's in that three to four leaf stage. We have had years where seed treatments have worn off, and even though a seed treatment was on, they still did have significant damage. So it doesn't mean you do not have to scout. You still should be scouting for flea beetles. And as well, these seed treatments um, are not registered for cut wounds. So you're best to be scouting regardless. And if you do need to use a foliar spray, there are several that are registered. Um, to wrap up, I have one slide on diamondback moth. I just wanted to mention really briefly that we do have diamondback moth traps up across Manitoba. We did get a few moths in our trap in the Carmen area uh, the past week. Uh, I didn't put the number in here. I just said some. Uh, the number is actually eight if you're interested. But I tend not to focus so much on the number. To me, what's more important is the date. For these traps to really be an effective monitoring tool, they need to be out early. There is no point putting these traps. Well, I should say there's no point. There's less uh, advantage to putting these traps out in late May or June. For them to be really effective, they need to be out in late April, early May. And what is most important is more when the moths are arriving, more so than numbers, because we really don't know what the numbers mean. Uh, but we do know that if they arrive early in high numbers, we get more generations per season. Uh, diamondback moth can go through their through several generations a year in the Canadian prairies. When they arrive late, late meaning June or later, uh, they go through fewer cycles. They have less potential to build up. When they arrive in early May or April even, uh, as this year they seem to have done in Manitoba. But again, we've only had a few in one trap so far, so it's too early to make any broad conclusions. But when they arrive early, they can be of uh, uh, potentially more uh, risk to the crop just because they have potential for an extra generation. But a lot depends on how well they establish, how many eggs get laid, uh, the cool conditions we're getting right now. Sure, they've arrived. These aren't ideal egg laying conditions and flying conditions for them. That might affect things somewhat as well. So I do encourage anyone, if you've got diamondback traps, uh, ideally they should be up already. If not, get them up ASAP. Because what really matters, more so than the numbers that you're going to be finding, is how early the moths have uh, arrived. As far as resources go, if you want more information, uh, our mastery website, we do have a fact sheet on cutworms and field crops. And that was revised this past spring. We do also have a fact sheet on flea beetles, on canola and mustard. Uh, this one we revise annually, but usually only the insecticide part. Uh, most of the fact sheet stays the same, but because there is insecticide information, that gets updated annually. And the, um, the 2011 updated version should be out in about a week, in case you're checking. Um, as far as other resources, Canola Council has a scouting and sweep net identification card. It's available online. and. It has a lot of photos of different insects you would see throughout the season. So if you're doing a lot of scouting in canola fields, uh, it's another resource you may want to consider acquiring. So maybe I'll end with that, and hopefully there's a few minutes that we can still have questions. Uh, yeah, you bet. We've run a little bit past the top of the hour, but uh, um, we are we already dealt with uh, a number of the questions, um, but there were a, a couple more here related to uh, to the flea beetles and, and diamondback that you were just covering. So I'll, I'll just get into those. Um, uh, the first question on the flea beetles was with with the uh, from Bruce. It it was a question about uh, recognizing that the majority of canola seed is treated with. Um, a similar mode of action than the neonicotinoid uh, insecticides. Um, what what might the risk be of insecticide resistance, um, and yeah. and what might affect that? That's a really good question, and uh, my answer is going to be somewhat speculative. But uh, having only one mode of action and having it repeatedly used against the pest is one of the conditions for um, I guess a more rapid buildup of resistance. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that's 
tends to build up resistance for insects that have more than one generation in a season, such as aphids, where you repeatedly use um, an insecticide, or diamondback moth even, that puts them at a higher risk too. Flea beetles have just the one generation per year, but we are putting the same uh, mode of action forward to them. The risk is certainly there. Um, we've got no evidence yet that that has happened. Uh, up until the last decade or so, we did have other options. We, for a long time, we had an organophosphate, um, organophosphate and uh, carbamate and an organochlorine that were being used. So the organochlorine being lindane and uh, fewer down encounter for a while. We had three different um, modes of action. But yes, with our current strategy, it is just one. Um, it's basically an experiment out there happening. We, we will see. Uh, it, is, it, it is a little on the risky side. It would be nice if we had uh, another mode of action that we could use as a seed treatment. Now, the foliar sprays we use, none of those are neonicotinoids. So if we were seeing uh, the flea beetles not being killed by the seed treatment and people were doing a foliar spray, they are using something that is not a neonicotinoid, which should be killing them, but it still doesn't uh, solve the problem. Uh, if we could get more um, insecticide groups as far as seed treatments, that would be great. The risk is there. Uh, how likely or how quick it is uh, likely to happen, it's speculative. It's hard to say. OK, great. Uh, there was a bit of a follow-up question on that as you were answering that. Uh, just a question on are there any differences among the different species as far as uh, activity of the, of the different control options? Okay, yeah, that's another very good question and it's something that's currently being researched. Now, uh, there was a study in Alberta, uh, a lab study, that uh, showed that the neonicotinoids uh, were more effective at killing crucifer flea beetles than they were striped flea beetles. So there was a little bit of speculation. Maybe that will lead to some sort of species shift towards more striped flea beetles. Uh, there is a little bit of data to, be, to back up uh, uh, that, that uh, statement or that hypothesis. Uh, currently, there's a research study going on where there are uh, sticky traps up trying to see if we are, in fact, seeing any kind of species shift. And there are more studies being conducted looking at this uh, potential difference between striped and crucifer flea beetles. They both will be killed by the neonicotinoids, but there is some evidence showing that the crucifer flea beetle uh, may have a higher mortality rate than the striped flea beetle. Okay. That being said, too, crucifer flea beetle is our more damaging species across uh, big parts of the prairies, maybe not so much in the Peace River area, northern Alberta, where striped is a bit more abundant. Uh, so if we did, we did have to have one that was being, um, I guess, killed a, a little bit better, uh, it would be the crucifer that we would want at this point anyway. Great. Thanks, John. Um, the only other question here was just a question. Um, I think you kind of answered with the sticky cards. Just a question about uh, how big an impact the, the wind has in terms of uh, when to expect the arrival of, of significant numbers of diamondback moth and, and uh, um, would the winds this spring already be influencing diamondback populations? Oh, uh, winds certainly do have a big impact on when they arrive. Where the winds are coming from, the wind speed, uh, and what they've been able to pick up along the way are all important. Uh, the interesting thing is that this year, so far, uh, there's a, a group at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon that actually look at uh, wind trajectories and try to match up uh, wind uh, patterns with the, the catches we, we see in our traps. And what they've found so far is we haven't had the south winds yet that have come over southern Manitoba that should have been dropping off diamondback moth. But there have been some winds from the Pacific Northwest that have come over this region that could have uh, 
brought them in. Now, normally, when we get big populations, they're coming from the south. And it's, it's those southern wind trajectories that we pay most attention to. Um, so those are the ones that we have to really focus on. Some of these wind patterns that are coming up from, uh, say, Texas, uh, the southern US, southeastern U.S. states, that's often where we see the big populations coming from. And so far, we haven't really seen those wind patterns uh, that should be bringing in a lot of diamondback moths. But again, something we have to keep an eye on because uh, most times when we do get larger populations, that's where they're coming from. Okay, great. Thanks very much, John, for all your information this morning. I think that pretty much covers all the questions that we got in so far. Uh, so uh, I just have a few questions or uh, comments to wrap things up. Some of you will have noticed I uh, put up the, uh, the code, uh, the validation code for uh, obtaining the pest management credit from uh, CCA for this uh, webinar, and you can go to the Canola Council website at the address you see on your screen, and there is a link there uh, to link to, it's actually a, a short survey in SurveyMonkey, and it's just uh, the survey set up to capture all the information that you need to submit. Uh, you'll submit that, and then we'll forward it on for you to access your credits. Um, and so, I uh, just want to wrap up again by thanking John very much uh, for, for his presentation today. I think it was really informative and we covered a lot of ground. And thanks for all of you for sticking with us.